Um, so I'm going to move through um, uh, the first part of this rather quickly, given all of what you've um, heard. My disclosures are there. Um, there's another kind of functional reserve that is recruited. You can think about this as sort of a static functional reserve. So this is not amino acid infusion, as Ronaldo was talking about, and an increase in measure GFR. This is maintaining GFR while you're losing nephrons. And of course, we know this happens in chronic kidney disease, it's hypofiltration, and maintain, maintenance of GFR. But presumably, as damage accrues in the tubules, either one of two things happen. Either the damage is spotty, uh, doesn't affect GFR, and of course, until you knock off enough tubules uh, cells to actually impede sodium and chloride reabsorption and then affect tubular matter feedback, you're not really going to lose GFR. Um, so that's what some of this could be. Yeah. The, some of it, though, could well be dropout of nephrons and increase in, uh, in function by recruiting nephrons and maintaining uh, stable creatinine. So it's an illusion that um, just because the creatinine is, is not changing, that you're not losing functional uh, nephrons. And you know this happens because you can donate a kidney, lose half your functional renal mass, and creatinine stays completely uh, constant. And so uh, we don't actually know what this is all about, right? We, we measure biomarkers, as, as uh, Michael was mentioning to you, and we see uh, quote unquote subclinical AKI, and we don't know what that is. We don't know if cells are being damaged, uh, but GFR is maintained because the damage isn't important enough to impact the GFR, or whether you're actually losing functional renal mass, but you've got sufficient reserve. We have some clues, however, because as we examine biomarkers, some biomarkers actually work better in patients that have underlying chronic kidney disease and therefore presumably less renal reserve. And so we do have a sense that, in fact, this is what's going on. But the purpose of this slide is to also demonstrate that there's another problem, and that problem is a temporal problem. So apart from all the things that Ronaldo just told you about with measuring serum creatinine or cystatin C, even if you had a perfect measure of GFR, you would have situations where the, the damage is accruing before GFR falls and whether that's functional reserve or something else, we're not sure. You have other times when the decline in function is happening at the same time as the accrual of damage. And you even have situations where you may have a pre-renal, uh, if you will, mechanism, although I don't particularly like that term, but you have a pure functional loss that's then followed by damage. And so what do you do when you're in this situation? You don't know whether something has happened. Using a damage marker to predict something is, is ridiculous, right? Because you can, you're can using the damage marker and you're seeing that the damage has already occurred. Well, that's AKI, whether it's subclinical AKI or clinical AKI that's being masked by recruitment of GFR and, and functional reserve. So you can't use a damage marker. You can't use a function marker. So what, what, can you, what can you do? You may be able to use a stress marker, and that's what we'll talk about. So it's always important to try to forecast something is about to happen. If you can't forecast that it's about to happen, it's good to know that it has just happened, and what you don't want to be is caught in a situation where it happened some time ago. And uh, that's, always, that's always bad, regardless of what kind of problem it is that uh, we're, we're dealing with. So um, we took the approach uh, with this biomarker to ask the question, let's recruit patients. Let's not use animal models. Let's recruit patients who have um, no evidence of acute kidney injury. Now, we didn't load them with amino acids to see whether or not they had a, a functional uh, uh, recruitment available to them. We didn't uh, uh, do biopsies to see whether there was damage, but there was no evidence that they had acute kidney injury at enrollment. And we asked the question, can we uh, find uh, acute kidney injury in these patients? And it was motivated uh, in retrospect. So as we uh, as we discovered these markers, 
it then became apparent that they're telling us something very different from what uh, we thought we were looking for. We thought we were looking for a very early damage signal. So the very earliest cells that die uh, or become very dysfunctional in, in a damaged sort of way, we would detect them. But it, it turns out that the kidney is smarter than we are. The kidney is actually responding to molecules that are filtered at the glomerulus, including damage-associated molecular patterns and pathogen-associated molecular patterns, and they're being picked up and sensed by pattern recognition receptors, toll-like receptors, and, others, and other receptors, including, by the way, the kidney has olfactory receptors. The kidney is literally tasting and smelling what's coming across the glomerulus and maybe even to a lesser extent what's being uh, transported across from the pericubular uh, capillary. And it's responding to this in a very stereotypical way. It is, uh, it is causing alarms to go off uh, in these tubular cells, and these alarms are uh, essentially res uh, responsible for telling cells in the neighborhood that there is a problem, and watch out that this alarm is uh, uh, telling you something is bad has happened. The cells respond by downregulating their metabolism uh, and going into cell cycle arrest. Why do they go into cell cycle arrest? Because it's a very bad thing if you're a cell to divide when you're under stress. Why? Because if your DNA is damaged and you divide, you die. The daughter cell is apoptose. If you go into cell, if you go into the cell cycle and you don't have enough bioenergetic reserve available, there's not enough energy available to reproduce all of your DNA, you stick in the cell cycle and you ultimately die. So, like I tell my adult children, reproduction is an expensive and dangerous thing. Don't do it until you're ready. The cells have the same philosophy. And epithelial cells go into cell cycle repeatedly to replace themselves. The renal epithelial cells are no different in their genetic makeup in many respects to epithelial cells elsewhere in the body. They even respond to UV radiation, despite the fact that UV radiation is probably not uh, 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 exposing uh, there's probably not a lot of renal tubular epithelial cells that are exposed to UV radiation. So, um, obviously, as uh, we discovered these biomarkers and found out that they were uh, markers of a renal protective mechanism, we began to wonder, do these molecules actually sense something other than damage? Do they sense stress? And so what is the evidence uh, for stress? So let me go through with you quickly how we, and Michael showed you some of this, so I'll go through very quickly, uh, how we discovered and validated these, and then I'll come back to the question of, uh, of stress at the end. So the way we did this is uh, um, we obtained uh, a, a series of cohorts from around the world, uh, various patients, different populations, different exposures, um, and we asked the question, what is in the urine that is associated with a change in renal function in the next 12 hours. And we found two markers, TIMP2, tissue inhibitor of metalloproteases 2, and insulin-like growth factor binding protein 7. We then validated those markers in a subsequent study of 700 patients, again, from many sites around the world. And you can see here that the combination of TIMP2 and IGFDP7 uh, is superior to any of the other markers that uh, have been looked at. Um, but here's where it got interesting. Of course, you know, TIMP2 and IGFDP7 were not household names for biomarkers of kidney function. And when we began to dig into the literature, most of it's coming from the cancer literature, where the trick is, if you're a cancer cell, you have the same issue, right? You want to divide, you want to metastasize, you want to cause uh, uh, a tumor to grow, but you want to do it carefully so that you don't die as a result of the chemotherapy being given, so you protect yourself, and you use TIMP2 and IGFBP7 in similar ways. So from the cancer literature, we discovered that these markers were associated with this phenomenon of G1 cell cycle arrest. But 
that's not where it ended. We then did uh, another uh, validation study for the U.S. FDA because uh, not happy with just a, a uh, set of uh, discovery and validation cohort. Uh, they want a whole new trial. So we then uh, did another study where we recruited a new cohort of patients, uh, this time 420 patients from U.S. sites, because of course the U.S. FDA doesn't believe data from Europe, uh, or Australia, God forbid. Um, so we recruited these patients from the U.S. centers, and then they threw us an interesting curveball, which I thought was, was crazy. In fact, I remember emailing Ronaldo and saying, what do you think about this? And he says, you're crazy, you can't do this. And it's to adjudicate every single case of acute kidney injury. And so we pulled together a panel of experts, and we said, tell us, use the Kidego criteria, we're looking for stage two, stage three AKI, but, Use your clinical judgment. Tell us as experts whether you think this is AKI or not. And actually, the receiver operative characteristic curve got better. It turns out the FDA actually was right, that if you use a more robust clinical standard, um, similar to what was done in cardiology trials for uh, discovery and validation of early cardiac markers, it wasn't sufficient just to validate it against an EKG. It had to be validated against a clinical um, adjudication of, of uh, myocardial infarction. And these markers add to uh, your uh, sort of typical risk factor analysis. So even if you round in the ICU uh, uh, with a biostatistician, uh, I don't get to round with a biostatistician, but probably Ronaldo does, uh, and um, uh, you have a clinical model, you can add to that clinical model with uh, the biomarker and you get an impressive lift in the receiver opera characteristic curve. So what is this telling us then? So these are markers that are responding to various stressors, and they're markers of a protective mechanism. So they're not damage markers in the way we think about Kim Wan and Engal. They are markers of cell stress. And it turns out that these markers go off even before the cell has been irreversibly or even measurably in a cell culture model, damaged. So they're stress markers. So how do we use stress markers? Well, the KDGO guideline, if you read the KDGO guideline, we, we have 30 pages of erudite discussion about how you should risk assess patients. And then we say, unfortunately, at the end, that there's really no good way to risk assess patients. Um, there's some, some reasonable scores for, for uh, cardiac surgical patients and uh, contrast AKI, but that's really all there is. You can't really assess patients uh, in the ICU, um, and so you can't really do these things very well unless you do them in all your patients. And of course, when we ask clinicians what they do, uh, uh, they all say, well, I, met, I do all these things to all my patients, but you don't. You can't discontinue all nephrotoxic drugs in all patients. You can't uh, do functional hemodynamic monitoring in all your patients. You can't necessarily monitor patients' uh, urine output and, and creatinine as intensely in all patients. Uh, you can't avoid radio contrast procedures in all patients. So you'd like to know whether or not um, the patients are at high risk. And that's where these markers really come into play. They provide a robust risk stratification. If you're above the 0.3 cutoff but less than the 2.0 cutoff, you are in a high-risk zone. If you're above the 2.0 cutoff, you're at a high-risk zone with a 17-and-a-half-fold increase in the risk of acute kidney injury. But this, my friends, is an illusion. As a clinician, you would not just say, well, I'm here or I'm here, because this relationship is across the entire range. You have steady increase in the relative risk. And we have little data way up here, but the risk continues to increase. So we have patients that we've seen in trials with values of 30 just before we go on dialysis. How does it perform in a cohort that um, we might uh, wish to examine more closely uh, for clinical purposes? These are patients that I take care of, so I'm very interested in understanding how this would work in a CTICU, uh, cardiac surgery environment. Here, the, uh, the uh, area under the cover area under the receiver operative characteristic curve is better, it's 0.86 than it is in general ICU population. You have a relative risk of seven above the 0.3 cutoff. Um, 
and highly statistically significant. Um, this is some data from Alex Zarbach uh, in which we uh, examined patients uh, after uh, cardiac surgery, and you can see there's this very stereotypical increase uh, with uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, separation between the patients that have AKI and no AKI. So how would we use this clinically? Well, I, I pulled my, my, my CTICU uh, colleagues and I said, what do we do when the creatinine doubles? And we agreed that basically these are the kinds of actions that we take when the creatinine doubles. We, we pay attention closer to creatinine in urine output. We, uh, uh, we're careful about fluid because it's a two-way street, right? Sometimes you want to give fluid if they're underfilled, but more often they're overfilled, and you want to be careful about giving fluid. So you want to be very judicious in your use of fluids. You don't want to give ACE inhibitors or, or non-steroidals in these patients. You also want to be careful about diuretics, uh, and you want to ask the question, am I missing something in this patient? And if it's a CTICU patient, uh, looking at the cardiac function is, of course, something you might uh, often miss. So how would we use a biomarker-guided approach? Well, in some patients, it doesn't matter what the biomarker uh, shows because they already have evidence of AKI, so they're high risk. Um, your clinical suspicion is high, they're high risk. But you have situations where you have no uh, evidence of AKI by function. Your clinical suspicion is low, but there are risk factors and you have a high biomarker concentration, you have a high-risk patient. Uh, what can you do about that? Well, immediately you can go toward essentially using that bundle of, of care that you would be using if the patient already had a doubling of serum creatinine. You also have a moderate risk group, which you may be a little bit different than the high-risk group. Maybe you'll not uh, be as aggressive, but you're certainly more aggressive than you are with the low-risk group. And I think this actually helps a lot because these patients, you can say, well, yeah, the creatinine is, you know, up slightly, but their levels are very low, and they have a negative predictive value of 97%. I don't need to worry very much about those patients. Later today, I'll talk about whether we can stimulate this alarm signal to trick the kidney into protecting itself as a therapeutic measure. Just a, a teaser for later today. So in conclusion, damage-associated molecular patterns and pathogen-associated molecular patterns uh, activate dendritic cells and T cells and stimulate endothelial cells directly, causing innate uh, inflammation. Arrest of cell function and loss of GFR occurs uh, through uh, tubular malar feedback. Markers of cell cycle arrest appear to be robust measures of risk for acute kidney injury. They've been validated now in more than 2,000 patients. They're FDA-approved. Uh, in the U.S. and available in Europe. Underlying, biologic suggest underlying biology is suggestive of an alarm phase, a stress marker before actual damage to the cells has occurred. Risk of AKI and long-term adverse outcomes increase uh, with increasing concentrations. And with that, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>